Good afternoon. Uh, I think this uh, little break we had, this lunch break, was a little more successful than we thought with uh, all the uh, exchanges of, uh, of uh, ideas, but also uh, the gallery walk seemed to be uh, in engaging as well. So I'd like to welcome everyone back. Uh, feel free to uh, bring your food in here and, and uh, continue to eat your lunch. Uh, panelists, I think we've, we've all uh, been nourished. Um, so uh, the panel three is uh, Trends in Undergraduate and Graduate Engineering Education, and our three panelists, uh, let me just briefly introduce them. Uh, first, we have uh, Dr. Richard Miller, who's president of the Olin College of Engineering. He's received numerous awards for his contributions to innovation in higher education and is a frequent speaker on new approaches to engineering education and his ideas have been both influential and widely quoted. Uh, Dr. Catherine Banks is Vice Chancellor and Dean of Engineering at Texas A&M University. She oversees the coordination and collaboration among the engineering, academic, and research programs at multiple universities and state agencies. She's particularly interested in projects that engage both the educational community and the broader community. And uh, finally, we have Andreas Agilaris, who's Dean of College of Engineering and Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He's spoken on the role of public universities in changing the workforce in engineering and has emphasized the importance of a diverse student body receiving an education with disciplinary depth but enhanced by cross-disciplinary experiences. So uh, the, the, again, the topic is trends in both undergraduate and graduate engineering education, and we'll start with uh, Dr. Miller. Uh, thank you very much. It's a real privilege to be here. Um, I'm going to try in just a few minutes to give you some broad sweep perceptions of what the trends are in engineering education, where we think the, the ball is going to be in the future more than where it is today. Um, my uh, current position at Olin College puts me in a very uh, awkward situation uh, for about 15 years. I've uh, been working outside of the mainstream um, as a result of one of those uh, crazy philanthropists that was discussed earlier, somebody who gave a lot of money to do something that foundations at the uh, National Academies wouldn't do. Um, so the Olin Foundation spent about <clears throat> $500 million to start over in higher ed, create a completely independent institution. It doesn't have tenure. It has no academic departments, which is actually a bigger deal than not having tenure. Um, it um, has an expiration date on everything that we do, including the curriculum. And our mission has been to rethink what it means to be an engineer in the 21st century and to rethink what it means to be educated, um, starting from a blank sheet. So we're into this now. We've graduated 10 classes. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit, not so much about the school, but about the lessons learned and the perceptions that we've seen. So let me begin by this sort of timeline of what we think is going on. Now, this is highly simplified, so don't, over, don't take too many notes, OK? Um, first, um, I think the unquestioned assumption that we all have, and maybe for 500 years, is the more you know, the better your life will be. That's why we send our kids to school. If they do well in school, we send them on to the PhD, because after all, the more you know, the better your life will be. This is what the knowledge economy is about. And therefore, what we're trying to do in school is to make sure that kids know stuff. So we want to put content in their heads. Uh, therefore, you want people in front of them who know something. And the best way to make sure of that is that they have PhDs. The most efficient way to do that is to put them in rows, have them take notes, and then ask them questions at the end, what do you know? So one of the ways of doing that questioning at the end, you might imagine as a giant Jeopardy game, where people are asked questions and you push the buzzer, and if you get them all right, then you, then you pass. There's a problem with that. It's called Google. Now while you're doing the um, Jeopardy game, somebody can Google the answer before you hit the buzzer without ever having studied the subject at all. Raising the question, is it really true? The more access to information you have, the better your life will be. Maybe there's more to it. The, the um, economic value of just knowing stuff is different. So things are shifting. 
And you can see this all over. Uh, for example, I would say we're moving into a maker economy. This is a transition that's true at almost every university I've seen. Now the idea is not just what you put into their heads, it's also what comes out. Life is a maker project, so everything they do is collaborative and is involved in making something that comes from inside, not outside. Not everything that's important in life is learned from a book. A lot of it comes from inside. Learning to listen to that voice inside and develop confidence is a really important part of this. What's the role of the teacher now? Um, it's different. It's no longer important that you be the expert. Now you're more of the coach. So it doesn't matter how far Bill Belichick, the coach of the uh, New England Patriots, can throw the ball. It only matters how far Tom Brady can throw the ball. So Belichick's role is to get the best out of the other people on the team, not to be the expert at everything himself. Um, the organization is different. Now you're seeing projects show up. Almost every university has projects showing up in the first couple of years. Small groups working on something that they make. It could be anything from a report to a book to a musical composition to a device to a robot to a small company. Um, this is experiential learning. It changes everything. What happens is now it matters what you can do with what you know, not just what you know. So for example, in our place, the average student when they graduate has completed about 25 projects. They present the prospective employer with a portfolio that has photographs and videos of things that they built. Employers tell us that the students appear to have as the equivalent of a couple of years of experience because they have. That's what they've been doing along the way. Um, we don't think this is the end of the timeline, that there is an innovation economy that's coming, uh, in which case what matters now is the original ideas and insights of the students. The organization for this is not clear. We don't know what it is. Um, our best shot at it at the moment is peers and mentors have a bigger influence on students here. It's the environment because after all, creativity has less to do with your DNA than it does with the environment that you're in. You can be highly creative in one environment and completely silent in another. Um, so this is all about the culture. Um, this is, you know, what are the tools that you use in the organization? Uh, our current best shot at it is intrinsic motivation and design thinking. So one of the, so what is design thinking? If you know about the D school, um, if you know about the Jacob school at Berkeley, um, there's a lot of experimentation going on now with design. Um, by the way, this should be the domain of engineering. Engineering is about envisioning what has never been and doing whatever it takes to make it happen. Applied science is about answering questions about why it happened. But engineering is about making things happen that never existed before. That's a design thing. Um, design is a different field than project-based learning. Project-based learning is like learning to paint by numbers. Okay, the teacher has already lined it up. They know what the outline is. You just put the right colors in the boxes. Design, on the other hand, is painting from a blank sheet. And you have to conceive, first of all, what is the problem? What is the outline? What should it look like? And that creativity exercises a different part of the brain. Different. And so how do you know uh, whether it works? It's what you conceive. If you think of it, the educational environment for the innovation economy is likely to look more like a kindergarten than it is a university lecture hall. It's not quiet. It has visual, exciting things on the walls. Uh, students are learning to find their voice. Different uh, image. By the way, this is not new. Uh, it's a fellow named Yeats who said long ago that education is not about the filling of a pail, which is what you see on the left, but it's about the lighting of a fire, which is what you see on the right. Um, I think education has to change. It, by the way, I should go back and mention one thing about this. This doesn't mean that everybody is going to stop teaching knowledge now and they're going to only uh, do design. What this means, for example, all of those are, exist at the same time. But even now, if you talk to the placement officer in the university, you'll find that there is a spectrum of starting salaries for graduates that come out of your university. It's actually not a bell-shaped curve. It's kind of bimodal. Um, there is a number of companies who are primarily interested in students that know things, very much like in the 1950s. There's an industry there, and, they, and it needs to be met, and students go to those companies, and they're quite happy there but the starting salaries are not high. 
If you look at the ones on the right edge, um, this is like Google, their starting salaries are in the six figures. And they're 22, and, it, and so now you get faculty members knocking on the door and saying, excuse me, why is my salary lower than my students? Um, which is, and there are reasons. Um, <laughs> why education, I'm not gonna go into that. <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna make it home alive. Um, why education must change. If you have seen this um, graph of human population throughout all history, in 1920, the global population was one billion. It's seven billion now on the way to nine billion. I don't think there's any aspect of human existence that won't be affected by that. This is in fact an existential threat. If you talk to population biologists, they'll say we have seen graphs like this before, you know, like the rabbits in Australia. Uh, in one generation, they're gone. Um, if we're going to avoid that, we're going to have to cooperate. We're going to have to learn in a different way that we are part of one human family and that means our education system needs to change as well. The National Academy, of course, has the 12 grand challenges, or 14, excuse me, um, that are in these different boxes. You will note that they're global, they're complex, they're multidisciplinary, and they're in fact not engineering. They're human challenges. Um, they are not only, by the way, this is one of my concerns. I could ask for a show of hands in the room right now, everybody who's an engineer or a scientist. Um, do we have the right people in the room to talk about the way education might change? Um, th this is a real concern. If you're talking about security, sustainability, health, and enhancing life, a lot of those challenges, things like sustainability, are the unintended consequences of the, of the solutions we had to problems in the 20th century because we had a, a room full of engineers and scientists who said, we can fix that. Um, and we didn't think about. So one of the, the consequences I'm talking about, the internet. This is a big advance, right? Uh, the real interest in the internet is that it improves life. It allows you access to all kinds of information. But it also allows you to only listen to people you already agree with. So in fact, it may not have had the effect that it was intended but instead, it may have had the effect of limiting what we know about other people. We now see a political system which is highly polarized. I'm not sure whether the internet contributes to that or not, but it doesn't seem to have fixed it. Um, we need a new kind of engineering innovator. So let me just talk briefly about innovation, one of those words that's so heavily used. I won't read this. Let me just say that innovation, if it works, changes the way people live. It's not just an idea. A profound innovation changes the way people live so profoundly that you can't remember the way life was before. So my kids can't imagine how the caveman must have lived before the cell phone. I mean, they just <laughs> always had this thing, right? Um, without implementation, it's just an idea. I think our traditional approach to education may actually be contributing to the in inhibition of innovation. Uh, this is, in fact, it could be a map of a major state university where I worked for many years. Up in the left there is the engineering school or the engineering quad. In the right, the green circle is the business school. And down there where the red circle is is where the library is for arts and sciences. Um, but what happens is that people who spend four years in the engineering school get a certain point of view. They begin to think about everything in life that's important. It's about feasibility. Is it possible to do this based on what we know about the natural law? If you think of it, that's what we do as scientists and engineers. And by omission, the other questions apparently aren't very important. But the people who are studying business, different ideas. Now it's not about science at all. It's about viability. Does this generate revenue? Is it legal? What does it take to start up? Um, how can you sustain this thing? How do you manage it? And that's what they have to do to get accredited. The people in the desirability circle have a completely different set of questions. Like for example, What's the nature of truth? What's the nature of beauty? What's the nature of love? Do you think those are important questions? They, in fact, have more to do with what people do in life and how they make decisions than the vectors that we see in the physics class. Um, and we're ignoring them. Uh, so why does this matter? Well, I believe it matters for this simple reason. Every innovation you can think of 
is simultaneously feasible and viable and desirable. And we have pulled those circles apart the way we have organized our universities and organized our learning model and made it nearly impossible for people to get exposure to all three. So does that matter? I was trained as a young engineering faculty member to go to Congress and to lobby for increases in the NSF budget so that they could spend more money on just in case science so that we could generate some ideas that generate companies, throw it over the wall to the tech transfer office. So those companies would generate new tax revenue, which would then generate more in income to NSF so they could circle it back to us. That's pretty much it, right? I mean, all innovation is about technology and science. But I had this weird experience. I've been on the board of trustees at Babson College, which is a business school for about 15 years. And you know, they talk about innovation all the time. How annoying. They don't even have a science program, and they're talking about innovation. I mean, how dare they? And I'm thinking there for years, I must be being punished for some sins in a previous life. And, and then it occurred to me, have you ever heard of the credit card? Do you think that might have changed life on the planet? And that didn't involve a Nobel Prize in physics. Maybe there's another way to change the way people live. How about Facebook? What does Facebook sell? I believe what Facebook sells is an opportunity to tell your personal story to a group of people whose lives you really care about. Maslow was right. After oxygen and water, the most important thing in life is to be the most important person in somebody else's life. And the way we have organized our society, it's very awkward and inconvenient to do that. And everyone is so mobile now, they don't live in the same planet with their parents. Um, that's the business model. You're not going to find that in the calculus book. You're only going to find it if you run into those people in the red circle. So we need to think about this. So I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to go very quickly. It's not just about content. It's about attitudes. It was Einstein who said, um, education is what's left over after you've forgotten everything that you learned. Okay? What's left over? Attitudes, behaviors, and motivations. And we are teaching attitudes, behaviors, and motivations every time you walk in the classroom, even though it's not in the calculus book, even though you're not paying attention to it. If you deliberately focus on that and produce the right kinds of attitudes, you will change the way the university works. Here's a list of them. They are um, embraced by lots of different companies, lots of different STEM connectors, 3,700 companies that have come out with an outline for the change in education. Um, in order to do this right, we need to change who we teach, what we teach, and how we teach. Um, there is a way to do this. Um, this is an interesting book by Tony Wagner at Harvard, <clears throat> How to Create Innovators. The bottom line is it's about improvisation. You can learn to improvise, but not without practicing. Um, I think it's time we thought about a national lab for STEM educational innovation. We talk about research as if it's the highest calling of everything that we do. And re research is important. But creating new prototypes, new models, um, is also important so that we'll have something to research. Um, have you heard of the Wright brothers? Um, these were not physicists. These were bicycle mechanics in Ohio. They invented aviation, which then later we discovered the field of aeronautics. Um, we need to have somebody in our society who is experimenting on that sort of grand scale. Um, my favorite quote, Chuck Vest. Making universities and engineering schools exciting, creative, adventurous, rigorous, demanding, and empowering milieus is imp more important than specifying curricular details. If you get the culture right, the rest will take care of itself. Thank you very much.